<laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start in about two minutes. So please take a moment and tell us in the chat box your name, where you're dialing in from. We'd love to know who you are and where you're joining us from. Um, so before we get started, a few tech items. You should see the chat icon in the bottom of your window in the middle, and we'll aim to answer any questions you have in there. That's also where we want you to share where you're from and who you are. Um, and uh, also in the upper right hand corner of your window, you should see a button for gallery view. Um, and that way you can see all the panelists at once. So you can kind of see everybody and, you know, kind of know who everybody is. So a little bit about, about us and kind of who we are and what we're doing. I'm Rebecca Taylor from GoCoach. Uh, we're hosting this webinar on embedding EQ in the workplace along with our partner, Think Human. A um, little bit about GoCoach. So we work with forward-thinking companies to provide personalized learning through career coaching. Uh, we enable companies to upskill their talent and empower employees to unlock their potential. Think Human works with growth organizations like Spotify, SoulCycle, and Snapchat, leading leadership development and manager training to support thriving growth cultures. So we have some great panelists today that our moderator will introduce who are going to be answering your questions. Uh, many of you submitted questions in your registration and you can also find the QA button on the bottom <coughs> and submit them there. So um, I'm gonna turn this over to Meredith. I'm actually gonna turn off my screen. I'll be living in the chat and sort of answering questions that you guys have there. And uh, Meredith, take it away. All right, exciting. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, all right, for the panelists that are here, am I now not share? Are we now not sharing the screen? Just making sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Don't see a screen. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We are so happy to have you here today. And over the next forty-five minutes, we have this incredible panel of experts sharing their experience and hard-learned lessons about building organizations uh, with high EQ baked in. And they're gonna be taking your questions. So jump into the chat box. We got many questions already through the registration process. We loved them. Thank you for sharing your questions already. And dive into the conversation with us, adding questions as we go. So as a starting point in this complex and volatile world that we live in, more than ever before, organizations need to be able to adapt and the World Economic Forum, I'm sure many people on this webinar already heard this fact, but the World Economic Forum in the last year named emotional intelligence one of the top 10 needed skills for 2020, of all skills in the top 10, and actually like, you know, high up there in the top 10. So uh, pretty important thing in today's workplace. And this incredible panel uh, is here to share their experience. So we have Siobhan O'Leary. Siobhan, say hello. Wave, yep. Siobhan O'Leary, the SVP of People and Culture at Convene. They're a workplace hospitality company that has a long list of accolades, including being on Inc's, Inc Magazine's list of fastest growing company and Fortune Magazine's number 11 best workplace. So yay, thank you for being here. We have Dr. Hank Clemens, an EI expert, author of EQ is for Everyone, and head of the Society for Emotional Intelligence that has 15 distributed chapters around the country. So excited to have you here. We have Elise James DeCruz, the VP of L&D from Media Math, who has awesome things to share. I had the benefit of getting to chat in advance with these panelists and learn from them. So Elise, thank you. And then lastly, uh, Think Human's partner in crime for this webinar, the CEO of Go Coach, Christy McCann Flynn. So thank you all for being here and let's get this party started. So let's start broadly. EQ can be a very uh, slippery topic. Uh, people can mean a lot of different things when they talk about it. So let's just start with when you're talking about EQ, what are you actually referring to? And Siobhan, if you would, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, for us, and I think for me personally, EQ means um, acute awareness of self and others. And that is the number one leadership trait that we focus on at Convene. And we, we talk about it constantly. We don't ever talk in terms of EQ itself, but we talk about values alignment, self-awareness, and intention and empathy. And through those um, 
sound bites, I suppose, or concepts, we get to uh, what our non-negotiable EQ is, if you will. Oh, there we go. I, I'm bound to do that every webinar. It was just kicked it off right from the beginning. So Christy, how about you? When you talk about EQ or think about EQ and how to bake it into organizations, what are you talking about? So the way that I look at EQ, it's more of a philosophy. And it's a philosophy of, you know, thinking about yourself and others, how you communicate with yourself and others, what's the awareness signals, you know, for what's going on and how you can either help or inhibit. And I think the biggest, you know, awareness signal, you know, with, you know, EQ is just a human component. When you look at EQ and you look at the philosophy, it really is a philosophy of us and what we're meant to be here, you know, as humans to help one another. And the only way that we're going to be able to help one another is through each other. Um, and so I think, you know, that is a whole quotient of, of you know, EQ, um, a, a mindset of philosophy in us. Yeah. Uh, anything, Hank or Elise, that you want to jump in and add before we move on, or you feel like that's a solid enough definition for starters? Well, I just want to jump in with just a tiny bit. One, I want to say, you know, both uh, Savon and Christy, in terms of how they uh, refer to EQ or EI, I, I think it's right on target. Uh, for me, uh, since there's this large, large thing called EI, we have to divide it up into bits and pieces. Um, for instance, you know, one of the areas that I like to focus on is social responsibility, and that is my relationship with others, helping others or helping them develop skills, uh, helping them uh, fulfill their needs or wants. So EI means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And we have to be careful when we use the term emotional intelligence. Some people focus on the emotional aspect, some focus on the intelligence aspect of it, but it's all about us. So we have to say, EQ is U.S., us. Yes, and uh, if I hear you right, tell me if I do. Uh, I'm going to reference back to something I heard you say in an earlier conversation, which I really loved, which is at its simplest form, EQ has a component that's about self and a component that's about other, and that in that self category, there's self-awareness and seeing ourselves uh, not just through our own lens, but as others perceive us, and self-regulation, right? That ability to moderate versus just be on automatic. And then uh, on the other category, having social sensitivity and being able to perceive accurately what's happening with others and have empathy for others and then have social skills. But I love just breaking it down most simply into developing those skills of self and other. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for, thanks for sharing that. All right, Elise, anything you want to add before we jump on, or should I send the next question your way? You can send the next question. All right. So uh, let's talk about what are some of the indicators in an organization of EQ being present or not present? So, <laughs> what, is, what does it look like when it's present, and what does it look like when it's not? And Elise, let's start with you. Sure. I think when uh, EQ is present in an organization, um, there's a, a sense of um, comfort and there's a safe space um, to share and express your feelings without um, you know, being concerned that there is going to be some type of um, you know, negative, negative feedback. Um, I, I think in, in an organization, it's really important to, as a leader, to model the behavior um, that you want to see across your organization. And when you see a company that is, is rooted in, um, you know, EQ, if you will, it's a company that uh, is open um, and safe and people feel um, that they can bring their full self um, to work. Yes. Something I really love about what you're saying, Elise, is there's been a lot of attention in the last couple of years on psychological safety and trust in organizations. And Google did this big project, Aristotle, doing all this research about the most fundamental ingredient to high performance teams is that safety or trust. And I love how you're connecting the dots because many people ask the question, well, great that psychological safety is a foundation for high performance, but how do you put that in place? And it sounds like you're saying the way to put that in place is 
developing EQ. And even specifically, I think you're pointing to develop the EQ of the leaders. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Making sure that they model the behavior. So. Yes. All right. Fabulous. And uh, anybody else want to, any of the other panelists want to jump in and share what does it look like when it's present? What does it look like when it's not in an organization? Yeah, Meredith, I'll jump in. I think, you know, if you want to be able to measure EQ from a performance uh, KPI sort of, I mean, it's our basic HR KPIs. It's turnover, right? If you have low turnover, you know, you can make a pretty strong assumption that, you know, your leaders are leading with EQ or else you're extremely overpaying people. Just kidding. But um <laughs> Uh, and then, then I think you look at customer satisfaction and of course employee satisfaction, but if you can look at your customer satisfaction scores and comments and they are extremely positive or right where you want them to be, whatever your measurement tool is, um, and a lot of companies are using NPS and then it, you know if you have a lot of promoters then they are, people in your organization are engaged and, it, and they're engaged because of self-awareness and awareness of others. I, I think what you're saying is fascinating, Siobhan, because very often things like EQ get relegated to uh, soft concepts that have no direct business impact. And if I hear you right, you're saying, EQ shows up in very specific business results and metrics like NPS score, turnover, and uh, was there another one that you said? NPS score and turnover? Employee the employee satisfaction. Employee satisfaction. So employee NPS. referral rate. You know, yes. employee referral rate. Um, yeah. And of course, legal action, right? If you have, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you're mitigating legal action, which we don't want to go down that road. Of course we could, but, um, you know, certainly that is a factor. Uh, that's super fascinating. Also, it opens a whole new question for me, which is very often when there are, uh, when there are legal issues or retention issues or um, ENPS issues, we look for uh, more formulaic solves, like, oh, we had a legal issue, it's with, um, you know, we need to do some kind of very specific, whether it's, you know, anti-bias training or gender or something like that. And it sounds like you're taking a cut deeper that not that those uh, other solves aren't useful, but that when you're developing an organization that has high EQ, you, you don't get those same kinds of issues. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, wow. you know, for anyone that is on the webinar that works in a startup or in a smaller organization where you wear a lot of hats and, you know, you come up against situations that you're not used to high handling and, you know, having joined this organization when it was 38 people, you could imagine, you know, what kinds of HR practices or people practices that did not exist yet. And um, so as we put in a formula or a value system that we all agreed on that we were our non-negotiables for behaviors, we could see um, a real lessening in any sort of grievances, call them. Whether they got to legal action or not, it's irrelevant, yeah. but it, it, was a, it was a grievance. And that is non-productive time, right? So when you're in those conversations, if you have low EQ on your team, and it doesn't, you know, we lead ourselves as much as we lead people. So at every level in the organization, you're looking for that. So if you have that uh, in your organization, you're a more productive organization. So yeah. if you're constantly looking to move forward and be profitable and move your product along in your brand, then you don't really have room for those grievances and those low EQ moments. Um, so that's another way to tie it. And we really, yes. it was fascinating for me to watch that path as we all agreed to this set of values and went with it. And, and we saw that train keep going down that track. It was fascinating for me to just see how, how well just simple platforms can take you to that real e level of EQ and, and be productive and profitable. All right, so uh, we've got sorry. business I metrics. Got no, don't say you're sorry. Thank you, Siobhan. Love that, and I really think it's very helpful for many of the pe many of us listening. 
uh, because oftentimes it's, it can be hard to uh, express to senior leaders, especially outside of the people function, why this kind of thing is a business imperative. And I think you just connected the dots in a really uh, useful and succinct way that EQ ties very specifically to these business results, retention, NPS, ENPS, uh, grievances of any sort, and when you have, when you elevate EQ, all those, all those things you specifically saw shift. So fascinating. Um, let's talk for, first actually, before we go on, any, any of you have something you're like dying to say to jump in or are you ready for the next question? All right, well, I'm gonna take that as a no. So we have a couple of questions that's popping all over in the chat box. Thank you, we love uh, seeing everything that you're saying in there. So uh, I think this is Aaron that asked uh, about measuring EQ and which of the individual assessments out there, in your view, have the most uh, potency and what's your experience with assessing EQ in a quantitative way? What's its value and how well have you seen it work and what can you share about that? And any of you can please jump in if you have something you wanna share about that. Uh, this is Christy. I, I could jump in on that um, just because uh, I'm a data dork to begin with and, and I'm constantly measuring everything. Um, so I, I think as far as tools, uh, there, there's a couple of things out there between Hogan and DIS that I think are really good. But the biggest and best tool goes back to the values of the organization. When you have a foundation of values, that's how people work, how people communicate, how people collaborate. And those are the measures that you should be applying into any type of hiring process, promotion process, Process, you know, decision-making process because anyone can comp complete a goal and everyone gets stressed out, you know, like, you know, when their back is against the wall and, and everybody like, you know, needs an outlet to be able to react. But when you're measuring how people are applying the values to how they're completing the goals, that's one of the best analytical measures that, that you could ever obtain. Hogan and, and DISC are really good, especially if you're using them in a, in a group, uh, you know, to continue to collaborate and open up doors because like one of the biggest things, you know, with measuring EQ is not just measuring your own, what's everybody else's EQ uh, around you? And I think that when people see those results and they're able to digest them and then share them with others and, and then be able to assess where they are currently right now and where they want to get together, you know, that's further go together. I, I think that that's a really good benchmark of a starting point and, and an end point as far as their own personal professional goals. Okay, and uh, oh, again, I'm going to jump again, in. For anybody who does, oh, did you want to say something, Hank? Go ahead. I was just going to jump in because that was yeah. the question was around uh, measuring uh, EQ. And there's two sides to this, and that is we can measure EQ and we get a score. And most people look at the score and say this is an indication whether I am high, mid-range, or low in this particular competency but that's not true in and of itself. It's much like measuring IQ, it gives us a number. It gives us a number. Whether we are applying it is really what we wanna talk about, know, and do. So we need to move from knowing what our EQ is to being able to apply EQ in the right situation at the right time. So, Measuring it and getting a score does not really tell us how well the individual use it. That's a second part to the story, if you will. So I think we need to get to that. And a lot of people know, but they don't do. Yeah. Uh, they get the score and they say, well, I have a high score. So that means that my IQ or my EQ is high. No, it means they have a high score in that. It doesn't mean that they are applying it. So from where I am, from what I do, I take them to the next level, and that is, let's see how you apply, let's say, social responsibility. Let's see how self-regard shows up for you in the workplace. Let's talk about how, you know, uh, empathy, or let's talk about, you know, any of these competencies show up, like Dr. Phil says on the show, how's that working for you? So <laughs> able to get to how's that working for you so you can have a high score but if it's not working for you it's not doing anything you can have a low score but if it's working for you then we need to understand in what context and what situation does it work and if it makes sense to do anything to 
improve in that area. So we need to move from the knowing, the score, to the doing or the application. Yeah. That's, my, that's my two cents. Yeah, it makes me think of the, oh, go ahead. Was somebody going to say something? Go ahead. It's Elise. I was just saying to, to, to add to that. Um, I, I completely agree uh, with the application. Um, it's also important to ensure that you have individuals within the organization that are going to hold you accountable um, and have a clear understanding that behavior change takes time and to create that safe space uh, to make mistakes along the way. Because it is really a journey, right? After you get the score, you're applying it. It's really important to have a, a trusted group of individuals or you know, trusted advisors internally and externally to hold you accountable uh, for those changes. Yes. Uh, you're talking about so many really potent things about what it takes to put this into practice. So one key thing I just want to highlight is the, you made me think, Hank, just to go back to you and then I'll come back to you at least, but Hank, you made me think of the parallel to uh, physical wellness and that you might think the number on the scale is great, but that doesn't mean you're healthy. <laughs> and so okay. the number on the scale goes, it's something, but it doesn't go that far. There's so much more about what is actual health and how it's getting expressed. And we can get distracted by, oh, that's the number, check. Uh, so if we, if we don't get overly hung up on these diagnostic tools, but instead use them as an entry point or an access to say, you know, okay, so how's that working for you? Um, and then to tie this back, at least to your point that there needs to be the opportunity to go to work on something and not just be automatically successful at it, but to be able to try and fail. How do you build in that kind of growth culture mentality into an organization to make it safe to try and fail. How uh, Rebecca is putting into the chat box, as many as you might see, that growth mindset and how important it is to, to an organization, but how do you bring that to life? So any of you have thoughts about how to get that uh, ability to enable failures when people are trying at these new things, including elevating their self-awareness? I think what's been really helpful, um, and I'm still a work in progress uh, as well, but I think uh, it's being vulnerable uh, and sharing, sharing your story um, and how you've overcome different scenarios uh, and encouraging team members or you know, cross-functional teams to share mm -hmm. their stories. I think it's really important. Um, you know, within, within my team, I, I talk a lot about you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable um, and understanding that we're all growing together. Uh, and try to create that trust uh, through storytelling. Uh, I think it's really important and listening um, to other people's stories. So for those people here who are uh, running functions in companies and they're thinking, Elise, I love what you're saying about storytelling and sharing vulnerability in that way, but how do you actually practically institutionalize that? What do you do? What action can people take to make that happen in the company? Well, this is Christy. I, I, I'd love to chime in if that's okay. Um, I, I think that there's a lot that, that could be applied to be able to show where you are and the progress that you're going. And I personally know, you know, through my own storytelling and people that I have coached, the story is the identity of you. And it's the best way to be able to represent, you know, who your whole self is, even with like, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of things that you're working through. When people understand your core and what makes you tick and you're able to show that as to what works and what doesn't work, it's showing not just the vulnerability, but it's also giving people a branch to be able to take, to know that, you know, we're all going to be a work in progress and it's how other people help us to further evolve. And they get a really good lens in from that, you know, by just understanding your story, understanding your motivation and understanding, you know, what, what your maximum impact and ROI is for yourself. Um, just having that, you know, lens, I, I think can provide a, a bigger lens into your evolution. So it seems like, Christy, getting individual leaders at every level of the organization to share stories, whether it's with their direct teams or just one-on-one, -on -one. but how do you do that? How do you get people to start to do that? If you're running a whole function or running a whole organization, how do you start to bake that in? Well, I'll give you an example of one CEO that I was coaching. And 
the CEO was a bit gruff with everybody. People really didn't like to communicate with him. Um, you know, micromanagement was used a lot. And when I was coaching him, I was just, you know, trying to get to like, you know, what's the thing that really keeps you up at night? And, and after a couple of minutes, he goes, I have 400 people that are underneath me. And, and, and I feared the day that I ever have to let go of any one of them because it's going to show that I failed. And, and what I said to him was, how many people have you told that to? And he's just like, no one. He goes, I can't say that. I'm like, why? You know, I mean, I, I think that that is a good thing that's keeping you up at night because it's keeping you honest and true to yourself. You're, you're having bad reactions with it because you're constantly, um, you know, pushing yourself in it and it's making people react in an adverse way. Tell the story and see what the dynamics are. So long story short, he told the story and in all hands and the perspective around him immediately started to change. And for you know every gripe and grievance that somebody had about him, they now had a better understanding of what his motivation and where it was coming from. And they were able to acclimate to that and he was able to acclimate to that. Great. So individual, any individual leader being willing to have the courage to share a vulnerability like that. In that case, a CEO, I have to imagine, has a far reaching cascade of people saying, oh, that's if, if that person's willing to do it, then maybe I'm going to model that behavior, too. Hank, did I cut you off? Did you want us to add something? No, I, I just thought that that was a very good story. And uh, you summed it up by using the term vulnerability. And I think that is one of the other cornerstones of emotional intelligence. That is the willingness uh, to be vulnerable. Uh, and that's sort of where self-regard comes in, is that if you are um, aware, if you are confident in who you are and what you do and how you do things, and then you can be vulnerable because you're not afraid that if you share a story that it's going to be lost or someone's going to take advantage of you. So being vulnerable, I think is very important. Yes. Thank you. Thank Can you. For that. Please, yeah. Siobhan, Christy. get in there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, agreed, agreed, agreed. And I, I think, you know, whenever we read about EQ or when we're sort of in the moment to wondering if the conversation we're having is creating trust to allow for vulnerability we're looking at how our leaders or how we as leaders are responding and are they reacting or are they responding and so if we're self-aware and we're responding and not reacting then we're encouraging failure to fail forward um, and so you know, it, it takes a lot to do that. And, and, the, and the other thing is we have to be aware of, you know, how to control ourselves to do that response or to listen intuitively so that we're not reacting. And our, our ability to see what the intention was behind whatever the initiative was that could have failed or been successful. But um, if, if our if we're our intention is to see the whole picture, we've got to be open in our brain is not in reaction mode, which then narrows down um, as as we know through you know the neuroscience um, research. So it, it's just a skill that we have to train ourselves to respond to to create that environment of trust and try things and be vulnerable and. I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, thank you, Siobhan. So you brought up this point of reacting versus responding, and I wanna dig into that for a moment. Many of the people that are on this webinar uh, have, uh, have already seen this research, so it's not necessarily news, but our amygdala reaction and our emotional responses happen instantaneously and our frontal cortex responds more slowly. So our more advanced processing is catching up to our emotional reaction. So the emotional reaction with the full neurochemical response, hormone response, physical reaction is in full gear before the advanced processing brain has said, all right, should I be upset about that? Should I not be upset about that? Do I want to, you know, do I want to have this reaction or not? So in your organizations and in the places that you're working and with the people that you're working with, it's one thing to know that conceptually, but how are you helping people actually deal with that complicated 
dance of being human where we're having emotional reactions before we can advance process and decide what the smartest choice forward is. Christy, it looks like you might want to say something. Is that true? Sure. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we all react and people say don't react, but I, I think that we got to be careful because a lot of times if there's good intentions behind the reaction, you need to move forward with it. If somebody's being hurt and everybody's just standing there and they're not reacting, guess what? That person is going to continue to be hurt. Um, and, and so I think that we have to understand the elements, we have to understand the motivation, and we have to understand you know, what the actual output that we're looking for in, in order to react or, or, or to stay, you know, you know, be more reside in everything that's going on. And so I do think it is a, a delicate balance, but I also think that if you have people that are 100% behind you and championing you and they know you, you know, I mean, once again, it's the understanding, the vulnerability and the essence of you that they, they know, they know where that intention is going to come from and, and, and they can react to it, I think, in, in a way that, you know, doesn't hurt or hinder, but progresses. Um, Christy, something I think is uh, nuanced in what you're saying is that uh, some reactions are positive and worth pursuing, even when we might have a tendency to mitigate them. And I guess if we want to work backwards, that's where self-awareness can come into play, right? So that we can see, oh, I have some awareness that I can be, you know, whatever, make people feel afraid. Even if I don't mean to, I can make people feel afraid to talk around me. Now that I have that awareness, I can start to regulate uh, my behavior. Or if I... In conversely, if I know sometimes I, or maybe not exactly conversely, but in a different scenario, if I know that sometimes I want to come to somebody's defense, but I don't because I don't immediately feel the courage in my body, then self-regulation can, in that case, close that self-awareness gap. Like now that I've seen that, I can step in and take an action even when I might not already. So if we work backwards for a moment and talk about raising self-awareness, if that's a prerequisite in some ways before self-regulation, what are some things you've seen work well to help people in organizations elevate their self-awareness? Anybody can jump in, any of you. I'll jump in. Um, Thanks, Siobhan. Yeah, I think regulating self-awareness is about a couple of things. From a business perspective, in an organization, we have rituals, right? We have cadence of meetings, certain ways we communicate. And if you have whatever your non-negotiables are for those rituals, if there's an element in there that is a gatekeeper of awareness and to keep those non-negotiables, then you, you can regulate it. And I'll give an example. Uh, when we first formed our executive team, people were from all different industries. So it was almost as if we spoke different business languages. So there were many times when in our initial reaction was to uh, disagree. So we implemented a ritual of before you disagree, you have to ask an open-ended question. And what it did was it created an ability, a, a training mechanism to respond instead of react, no, I disagree. And it created a learning opportunity. So we were constantly uh, trying to learn from each other and developing our self-awareness of that urge to disagree, our urge to just, eh, you know, from our last language that we knew. So it's just about rituals so that, um, to Christy's point earlier about intentions, so that your intentions can be made clear, you need some platform. Um, and so they're not misunderstood. So I, I think it's about setting up rituals to, to support what, what your intentions may or may not be. Siobhan, I think in so many cases, uh, shifting behavior can seem elusive. Like, how, how do you change one person's behavior? How do you change, let alone, how do you change organizational behavior? And I just really want to call out those kinds of rituals and practices. And if you have the support of influencers in the organization to honor those practices, then you're going to start to change uh, manifest behavior, which then starts to change the overall EQ of the organization, right? It works from the inside out. The behavior shift of asking an open-ended question starts to 
create curiosity, even if it wasn't naturally there, uh, just because of all that's, that's how I have to react. So uh, I think that's a really important call out that practices and rituals uh, shift behavior. So going back then to the question of elevating self-awareness, I just wanna, cause people are asking about it in the chat. I wanna make sure to give the rest of you panelists the chance to answer that question. Anything else you see that really helps elevate self-awareness? that others on this call can start to implement and use. I just want to make um Christy, you muted yourself. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? I'll go after. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. I, I just want to make one call out too, like, you know, as far as this like Social media has really put in like, you know, an interesting potion and spin on everything that we're doing. And I think that, you know, we have to look at, you know, what people are inferring and, and what people are relating to and understanding the why behind it, too. Because like a lot of times EQ is really kind of going to like, you know, the bottom because everybody is like listening as to what's on a blog or what's in a medium. And they're not really listening to what the intent is inside themselves and who they're working with. So if I, if I hear you right, Christy, tell me if I am, that part of self-awareness is not just seeing how others perceive you, but also coming to know yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Just being driven by others. That's a, yet another nuanced toggle, which is a lot of people in organizations uh, have to work on myself included, maybe all of us have both sides of that is how well do we know ourselves and then how well can we see how we are perceived by others. So thoughts from other panelists about how to elevate either one of those things. Yeah, I, I would also, I would also add, I mean, you know, I, just like you said, like we're all, we're all a work, work in progress. We're all trying to, um, you know, become more self-aware throughout this journey. Uh, I also think it's important to make sure that we're, giving ourselves permission to change and giving ourselves permission, obviously, you know, to grow and be in situations that might push the boundaries um, to get to know others, um, because that's the way that you really grow, right? I mean, if you're, you know, around diversity and inclusion, if you're surrounded by the same people with the same mindset, it's hard to grow. But it's like, you know, what can we do as, as humans to challenge ourselves to get out of our comfort zone and get to know others um, and meet each person where they are in their journey? And then we mm -hmm. it will inherently grow. Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, I have certainly seen that in my own journey, that I seemed a certain amount of self-aware when I was surrounded by people who were just like me. And I seemed a lot self less self-aware when all of a sudden I found myself in new contexts around people that were not like me. So powerful point, Elise. Hank, anything you want to add about elevating self-awareness and how people can do that? You're on mute. Uh, what, do you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Good, yeah. okay. No, what comes to mind is one of those old tools that's been around for a long, long time, the Jahari window. Anyone familiar with the Johari window? I, think I am, a, but please talk about what it is for those who don't know it. Oh, okay. Well, the Johari window was developed by a couple of guys from UCLA back in 1955 uh, by Joseph Luft and Harry Ingham. And it says that we're all made up of just one big window, and you can take that window and divide it into four uh, compartments, and each would be a window pane. One part of the window pane is very clear and open and you can see right through it and you know everything that's going on. And so we call that the open. It would be things that you know about yourself and things that others know about you, others knowing those same things. So that's a great part of you because you're open, people know those things and you know those things, so that's great. But then there's another part of you, uh, part of your window called the hidden. And that part of your window is where you tend to uh, maybe uh, not share things about yourself that may be very important for others to know, um, but you know it, but they don't know it. And so you sort of keep it hidden, if you will. And then there's another part of your window that where other people know things about you that you don't know about yourself. And for instance, maybe you just went out and bought a new uh, winter coat and 
you took all the tags off of it, you thought, but uh, you neglected to take one off the back collar. And so you're walking down the street, you're thinking you're looking great in your brand new winter coat. And there may be people that may be snickering or people that may be pointing at you because you have that tag or label on your coat. Well, that's information that they know about you that you didn't know about yourself. And it would be great if they would share that information with you so that you would know it too. It would make your open window much larger, the same as if you would share things about yourself and not hide it, it would make your open window a lot larger. And then finally, there's that part of you that's called the unknown. There are parts of you, or things about you that you don't even know, nor does anyone else. And so if you work on sharing more information about yourself, we call that disclosure, or getting feedback and encouraging feedback from others, what happens is you make your open window much larger or you make that whole part of you much larger. And that's the transparency sometimes that is important to have, you know, in an organization. So when we talk about, you know, that awareness piece, you are now more aware of things because your open is larger. People are sharing more information with you. You're getting more information and sharing with others. So that's an aspect of this concept of self-awareness. And there's this tool out there called Jahari Window that's pretty much free. You can just Google it and, and put it to work. It's been around for a long time. So no one really owns it now. Yeah, but the yeah. concept is, is one that we can put to use easily. It's fantastic. Hank, thank you so much for sharing that. The chat box is blowing up with people asking, you know, how do you spell it? They already, somebody else already answered that question, but it's just a really valuable resource. And I want to jump on the back of that to say one other thing about feedback uh, as one of the windows. I had, uh, I was walking down, the, walking down the corridor of a very crowded mall and this horrified man, a little older than me, came up to me and told me that my dress was unbuttoned, all, I mean, unzipped all the way down, like, where you don't want your dress unzipped. And he was so embarrassed to tell me, but that he did, I was so immeasurably grateful. Like, I wanted yes. to hug him, thank him, oh my gosh, what can I do for you? And we get funny in organizations about giving feedback because we think, oh, it's going to be awkward and uncomfortable, and yet it can be so potent. And sometimes feedback can be given in a very um, harsh and unproductive way. So I don't want to make it sound like all bits of feedback are valuable and EQ enhancing, but I would love to hear from any of you, how have you used feedback, whether it's one-on-one -on -one to an employee or even organizational feedback from your employees about you know, upward feedback to a manager or even to the whole organization about how well you're living your values, but how are you using feedback to help the EQ of your organization? And any one of you can jump in, please. Well, this is Christy. I just asked for it. I ask for it every day at the close of every meeting. What am I doing well? What can I do better? And, you know, I've gotten lots of different tidbits. You know, recently James told me today, sent me emails. So I need to make sure that I maximize my team's time and everybody else's time. Um, but, you know, I, I see feedback as a gift and it's about how applying it. And even though the intention may come off like, you know, where you you get some bad feedback or somebody's really harsh it's about trying to find a silver lining in it because forget about how it made you feel think about what you want to do with it moving forward fantastic anybody else thank you christy so modeling it from leaders and asking for it and you can even as siobhan uh, said about embedding practices or rituals that can even be a ritual to start to test that's interesting anybody else have anything they want to add about and including those of you out listening to the webinar feel free to add ideas into the chat box if you have things that you are seeing in your organizations about how you're using feedback to elevate EQ but anybody on the panel have anything you want to add to that I'll jump in there um, so somebody on the on the chat box talked about radical candor and that is an amazing book and um, it's just spot on and we've we've all read that here and talked about it but I think the irony of this loop of EQ and feedback and just, you know, going around and around is, is important, right? Um, 
with the generational shifts that we have with five generations in the workforce, with a predominantly millennial workforce, feedback is a non-negotiable anywhere. And so if we want to give it and be productive and keep moving forward, we've got to give it in and with high EQ, ironically, right? So um, there's, it's just not an option because people are looking for it and the world is moving too fast through technology, through everything that you've got to be able to give feedback to change what you need to change, be agile and move forward fast. So it's not an option. It's just choosing to do it in your organization where it's going to be the most productive and well received and radical candor is a fantastic book okay so one way to start to or actually two ways to start to embed a positive feedback loop or an effective i should say it's not positive feedback could be constructive feedback but uh, an effective feedback loop is either modeling the behavior by asking for feedback and putting things into practice uh, and making that a ritual or you said Siobhan having everybody read radical candor and discuss it any other ways that you are seeing uh, putting into practice and embedding in organizational structures using feedback to elevate EQ so that A, people are giving feedback in a way that is safe and actionable and can make it past people's defenses because that's one critical part. And then B, how are you getting people on the receiving side of feedback to want to be hungry to get it and put it into practice? So either of those, an answer from anybody? Elise, how about you? Yeah, yeah I think, um, you know, being consistent is, is important. Um, you know, I know throughout the years, we've gone through 360 feedbacks, uh, you know, uh, feedback um, programs. And I think, you know, to the conversation, like having feedback be ongoing um, and a natural part of, uh, of the conversation, a natural part of the culture within the organization um, is, is really important. So it's not like an event. You know, it's happening all the time and it's tied to your company values, whatever those values are. Um, and, and I think if we can kind of get out of the, the, the mindset that it's, a, it's an event that takes place, you know, twice, twice a year or quarterly um, and really make it a part of the, the culture and make it a part of, um, you know, ongoing conversation and, and growth, um, both you know, individually and throughout the company, uh, I think that will, you know, promote um, more positive um, emotional intelligence um, and collaboration. Um, and one, you know, one other thing that I was thinking about is um, like making sure it's, it's time bound um, and that we're, we're asking individuals on our team how they like to receive feedback. You know, feedback is absolutely a gift. And I think that we have to be sensitive to um, individuals both inside and outside of our, our team uh, to make sure that they are receiving that feedback in a way that's going to resonate with them so that they can apply it in a way um, that's action oriented and time bound. All right, so Elise, everything you're saying, brilliant. We all wanna put it into action. How do you hire people that have the capability to do those things? Or if you already have people in your organization, how do you develop them to have those skills, to have the consistency of giving feedback, to ask, you know, to, so that they know to ask how people want to receive feedback? How do you embed, how are you seeing these skills embedded? And anyone of you can jump in after Elise. Okay, yeah, I mean, through training, um, pro, um, training, coaching is obviously important. Um, and Christy, you can certainly speak, speak to that. Um, and, you know, thought, like, I would say celebrating the, celebrating this journey, right? Celebrating those, um, the, you know, those opportunities where you provide feedback and it's gone really well and opportunities where maybe it hasn't gone very well. So, so I think, you know, we, oftentimes we might wait for the, you know, the big reveal um, and we don't celebrate those wins in progress. Uh, moments, and I think it's important to, um, you know, celebrate those and encourage those with the people that are on your team. Uh, well, and, uh, oh, go ahead, Hank, please. No, the, this, this is just brief, and I wanted to kind of jump in behind Elise and, and Christy both and, and talking about feedback, because I think one of, the, one of the things that since this 
the whole webinar is sort of around emotional intelligence. We want to kind of, you know, because sometimes people say, well, what's feedback got to do with emotional intelligence? Well, you know, sort of everything, because one, uh, how do you get feedback to become embedded in the organization? One, I think, is through leadership or through those who demonstrate or asking the question, please give me feedback or, or demonstrating how they want feedback. So it's sort of like that trickle down uh, concept when one sees how their boss gets feedback or consistently asks for feedback, then they begin to do the same kinds of things or similar kinds of things because that becomes a part of the culture of the organization. And so even the, the person, you know, at the entry level position will be asking for feedback because they see and they know that that's what's done in the organization. Also, it helps build something called self-regard as it relates to emotional intelligence within an individual so that they begin to bolster or feel more positive or more confident in themselves because they're able to ask for and able to accept and able to deal with the feedback that they get without, let's say, losing track of who they are or what it's all about. So that was just my quick two cents worth. That's fantastic, Hank. I think that this com concept of self-regard is an often overlooked component in organizations. Like, oh, just give the feedback, take the feedback, put the feedback into action. But if self-regard is missing, then our defenses can't take it in. It's too painful. The self-regard needs to be there to be able to put it into practice. Uh, and, and similarly, if we're giving feedback in a way that's taking down self-regard, it becomes self-defeating. Even if we're trying to give feedback that the intent is positive, if we don't have the self-awareness about the impact it's having, we miss the point. So thank you, Hank, I love that. Um, I wanna move uh, from, self, from the self con category to the other for a moment and talk about empathy building and social sensitivity building and uh, how, how you are seeing in organizations building and embedding these skills. So uh, Siobhan, any, anything you want to jump in yeah, with? Sure. Uh, this is a big deal for us, empathy. Uh, you know, and it's something that we, we use this term a lot in our organization as it relates to everything, as it relates to each other, as it relates to our customer experience, our employee experience, and our design. A big component of our, uh, of our organization is our human-centered design and empathy is a big piece. What I think it means from a leadership perspective and an EQ perspective is not being afraid of feelings. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to share that feeling um, but it, it, it speaks to intention, which Christy spoke about a lot, and, and not being afraid of dealing with someone's feelings. And so, you know, we grew up, you know, years ago, and, and our business mindset was feeling, leave your feelings and emotions at the door. But the reality is feelings and emotions are, are what are really driving our businesses now to create experiences when we don't really need to be together. And so empathy is such a huge piece of that. I mean, you can look at what's going on in retail and recognize that, you know, the retail industry is not anywhere near it. We all buy online, but how do they get the empathy to sell to us online? It's the very few human interactions we have with whatever salesperson at Nike you know, when we do go into that store, create, they're empathetic to something about us that makes that online experience what it is. So empathy is a huge business driver now, and we would have never said that 15 years ago. And it's a yeah. huge component of, of EQ. And it's because we're not afraid to speak about feelings in the workplace. Um, that's just my passionate opinion on that, Meredith, but uh, that's what I, I see around me um, working in the environment I work in. 
Yes, an emphatic yes to that. As we, as a, or as a culture, become more and more driven toward and by technology and AI, the human components are actually shockingly becoming even more important. Emotions rising to the foreground in the, in the workplace and the human skills now on the top 10 list of skills that are the most important to have. So then how do we help people build empathy? What are ways that you are doing that? Uh, Hank, how about you? You're, You're muted. muted Hank. I apologize, I was <laughs> muted. Uh, I think one of the easiest and best ways to, for, for individuals to build empathy is to think back to their childhood to reflect on their childhood when things didn't go the way that they felt that they should, how did they feel about that? Or when they thought about or when they saw other kids getting the toys or the dolls or whatever that they wanted, how did they feel about that? And so from that, that emotion, that emotion, and we still have it from our childhood, you know, when, some other kid got something that we probably wanted. We still feel that we have, we've outgrown it and we can deal with it. Well, some of us anyway, uh, and we can deal with it, but it's that feeling that we get. So whether we're in the workplace now or whatever, if we can just reflect back on the loss of something or something that we didn't get, the emotion is there. We can equate that emotion with most of the things that we deal with in today's environment. It's usually around a loss. So I think we get people to, to express and or think about a loss, they can then find it easier to move to other areas. Thank you. So we have three minutes left to wrap up. So uh, in a laser fashion, we're gonna do a round robin of What's your one piece of final advice? If people that are participating in this webinar are going to do one thing coming out of this, uh, coming out of participating, one action they're going to take, what is the one most important high leverage thing they do or the one piece of advice you have with them? And Elise, let's start with you. Um, okay, here we go. I'd say, um, you know, give your give yourself permission. To grow. Great. Give yourself permission to grow. How about you, Christy? Um, I look at the one piece of advice is that failure is okay. It makes us and it breaks us, but it also redefines us and where we need to go to. Mm, it makes us, it breaks us, and it redefines us to where we need to go. That's poetry. Thank you, Christy. Hank? Yes. Mine would be to move from the knowing to the doing. Mm. Brilliance. Thank you. Love it. And Siobhan, bring it home. Don't kill me, but I have two things. Okay. Uh, number one, implement a coaching program because there's no athlete that goes on the field without a coach, and the coach can help you move from knowing to doing. And uh, my second thing is what I said before, create some deliberate rituals that allow you the opportunity to drive your EQ initiatives. Amazing. Love it. And I just have to say, Christy and Siobhan have never even met. Christy did not pay Siobhan to say that. That was just Siobhan's raw, unadulterated advice. This is their first time meeting. So to everybody that is uh, here as a panelist, Siobhan, Elise, Christy, and Hank, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom. To everybody that has dialed in to participate in this community, Thank you. Your contributions and questions were incredible. Clearly, you have so much to contribute on this topic yourselves. I love what's happening in the chat. And have a fantastic rest of your day and week. And uh, keep a lookout for the video recording in your email in the next couple of days. And goodbye for now. Goodbye, everyone. Have an EI day. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye.